Hello, this is James Bond, the Godfather Show. I feel good. You're checking out my man, Mike Siegel. Hit it, buddy. Hit it, buddy. Hit it, buddy. Welcome in, big hour coming up as we get started with our conversation. It's a pleasure to be here, and it is a pleasure to talk about this hour and the millennials, people who um, are very apprehensive, properly so, that pensions will not be funded, that Social Security will not be funded by the time they get there, and so what do you do about it? We have a real problem because most people in their baby boomer years have not prepared for retirement. And with this is Lane Mendelson to talk about this and the phenomenon of everything that's happening. I mean, we've got a, a great economy, uh, but what does that mean in terms of planning and preparation to make sure we stay that way in the event that the economy tanks? Are we going to protect ourselves? Mr. Mendelson is president of Vantage Point Software. Uh, they've done a lot of work over the years. They use artificial intelligence. They give traders advance notice of changes in trends on the market. Uh, you can enter and exit any investment at the proper time, at the optimal time. And so, obviously, if you buy low and sell high, in other words, you're going to be doing okay and it leads to more profitable opportunities for you. And so uh, we're glad to have him with us to talk about some of the findings of a study by Bankrate, the Federal Reserve, and the Bank of the West. These banks did a study about millennials. Mr. Nelson, it's nice to have you with us. How are you? I'm doing great, Mike. Thank you. How are you doing? Pretty well. Um, I'm interested in this whole thing. First of all, can you define for us what a millennial is? We have uh, uh, baby boomers, millennials, this group, that group. What, what, what is the age group of a millennial? Is there a hard and fast rule? Yeah, it, it's kind of a term that's thrown around loosely, but the actual um, uh, years would be born between 1981 and 2001. So that puts the, uh, the, the demographic at between 37 years and 17 years old. Okay, so 17 to 37. Now, uh, what's the sense of, of those people about whether, in fact, uh, their Social Security is going to be there, or their pension fund from their company will be there. Do they even think about those things at those, well, obviously at 17 you probably don't, but as you get into your 20s and 30s, do these people even think about that future? Yeah, well, th see, and that's the interesting thing. Like, as a 17-year-old, you're not thinking about that. As a 37-year-old, you absolutely should be. Yet, uh, all of those people are thrown into this bucket and labeled as a millennial. So, But it's, it really is uh, two different populations of people, um, yeah, I mean, I think they are thinking about that, and they're wondering, and they're curious, and they're concerned, and, you know, um, it's just it's one of those things where um, this, this population of people, they saw, you know, things happen to their parents, let's say, that impacted them, and uh, they, they don't have a lot of trust, and they don't have a lot of confidence, and, um, you know, that's kind of led to, to where we are right now and where, where their mindset is. Well, but it's, I would think for somebody in their 20s and 30s, it can become awfully confusing. I mean, a lot of young people are making a good living in the high-tech field, IT. Amazon hires thousands upon thousands. Um, they bought up most a uh, good part of downtown Seattle on 6th Avenue, uh, and now they're opening a second location as well. I mean, they just have huge numbers of employees, uh, obviously Google and Yahoo and all the others. So with, with, with that going on, and these people, what, we, what I understand at least from people in the industry is that you put a lot of time in. It's a lot of hard work. Uh, the return is great, but you don't have a lot of free time. You're putting in a lot of hours, maybe doing traveling, and there's not a lot of time to think about the future because you're making pretty good money. So if you're making pretty good money, uh, you might not be thinking down the road because you're living well now and you probably think it's going to go on uh, indefinitely which, of course, may not be the case. Is that a trap that people in that younger age group are falling into? Yeah, I think, I think to some degree. I mean, they're, they're working hard. Um, they're, in, in one respect, living in the here and now. They want to buy homes. They want to have families. They want to live the American dream. 
And from a millennial's perspective, and this was a survey that was done by Bank of West, uh, the American dream as defined by a millennial is three things, owning a home, becoming debt-free, and retiring comfortably. Those are the three things that millennials think are important. Six out of ten millennials do believe that the American dream is attainable today. But at the same time, you know, they're facing uh, rising costs. And, you know, just look at, like, health care costs and the increases they've seen there. Um, and, yeah, it is a concern that how am I supposed to balance the here and now and raising a family and owning a house and all of the, you know, day-to-day expenses, but I'm also simultaneously expected to be putting money in savings and then investing. And, yeah, it, um, it's something that um, makes it very daunting for a millennial, specifically uh, a lot of the millennials who haven't been really educated on investing and saving in the financial markets. And I don't blame the millennials for that. I really think that the previous generation does have a responsibility to teach the next generation this is what you need to be financially responsible and put yourself in a good position financially. And, and I think there was a little bit of a, a, a breakdown there. Um, when I was 12 years old, my dad opened up an IRA account for me. So, you know, I, I'm very thankful that my father had that foresight to um, help teach me at a very young age um, that, yeah, you need to start saving, you need to think about a retirement account. Here I am, 12 years old, i got a retirement account. I've done the same thing for my daughters, opened up, you know, custodial accounts, teaching them about the stock market. And um, I think a lot of it just kind of comes back to lack of education. Well, you know, but the, the, uh, the point is that what you're earning now um, is really going in, from what I understand, uh, into housing because we've had a very strong housing market pretty much across the country. And so you go to these high-tech areas uh, in California, Washington, uh, New York, um, some of the other places, and um, uh, Arizona, they have Intel now building a big plant. But the point is that the housing has gone up to the point that I'm being told that people working in those industries are – what I would call house poor, that the mortgages are very substantial because that's what the costs are for these homes, even though they may not be palaces. You would think at the prices they would be, but they aren't. And um, and so you're struggling to survive paying your mortgage. So there isn't even at this point a lot of free uh, expendable income. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah it's absolutely correct. And the, the price of housing it has become very expensive. Uh, currently, Two in ten millennials who plan to buy a home, they're expecting to dip into their retirement accounts because those who have saved, they have that money, but at the same time, yeah, that's for when I'm older. That's for when I'm ready to retire, but I need a house now for my family. So they're going to you know, dip into their, their savings, their retirement, to buy a house now. Three in ten millennials who are currently homeowners have already done that, taken money out of retirement accounts to make a purchase of a house, which admittedly, is being purchased at a very high price, and, you know, all you need is the, the housing market to, to weaken or pull back or collapse, and then they've got a real problem. Well, you know, and I, I saw it happen myself because I had uh, the um, a, a home in Seattle. I got three and a half times what I paid when I sold it and multiple offers and all that, and uh, and it's become – a very pressure-oriented market for young people. How much expendable income is left for investing in some kind of a long-term, let's say, retirement account or IRA or 401K or whatever? Um, do these people have uh, expendable income that they can put away? It's something that is it's difficult. I mean, everyone obviously is, is earning different incomes, but – this is where you really have to have a plan. You have to look at it and say, okay, how old am I now? How old do I want to be when I retire? I mean, if you think of it this way, let's say that uh, someone's 22 years old. They're working, maybe they're, they're making $50,000 a year, and they want to retire when they're 67. So they save 10% of their $50,000 a year salary, and they, they put that in, in a 401k. If they, let's say they invested that money in a money market fund. You know, they, uh, let me ask you to pick it up. We come back on the other side, and we'll do that right after yeah. this. Stay with us. Let's get back to it. Mike Stevenson, good to have you with us. Wayne Mendelson is here from Vantage Point. 
He is president of that organization, and they do analysis uh, using a whole lot of artificial intelligence uh, about the markets, when to get in, when to get out, and all of that. And we're talking about millennials and what they should be doing and thinking about. Uh, definition of millennial, by the way, is ages, at this point, 17 to 37. All right, so, uh, Mr. Mendelson, you were talking about an important point before the break as to when uh, the people, how much people should be putting into um, uh, their, their um, whether it's retirement or some kind of investment for later in life. So let's let's get back to that. You were talking about somebody from age 22 to 67 working, which I'll just point out that and well, now we assume people work longer than they did previously. 65 is no longer the retirement age. Uh, it's been upped. Um, but Social Security and other things. So let me let me ask you. Uh, somebody could be making fifty thousand a year. Somebody else one hundred thousand a year. Somebody else one fifty. Somebody else two fifty. Um, is it, you mentioned, let's say, putting away ten percent. Is the rule of thumb that everybody should put away ten percent, or is it based on how much income you have that you put more or less than that? Well, I, I think it's based on on how much income. It's also based on if you have a family. There there are many other considerations, but I guess my point is, even at a fifty thousand dollar a year salary. If someone was to put aside 10%, at, if, if they don't understand the value of compounding, and let's say they put 10% away and they're getting 2% on that money, when they retire at age 67, they're going to end up at about 360000 which is not bad. But if instead they were to contribute you know, their 10% to some sort of balanced fund with you know, stocks and bonds, and they were getting, let's say, an 8% yield annually compounded, at 67, they'd have 1.9 million, and it's like Warren Buffett has described the the phenomena of compounding as like the eighth wonder of the world, and I think that what's happened is a lot of the millennials have been jaded because you know some of them saw you know what happened to their parents, 1987 stock market crash, dot com bubble burst in 2000, 2008 financial crisis, makes you a little nervous about t working hard and taking your money and putting it into this thing called the stock market. When you've seen that, it's not all rosy. It doesn't just because you put it there doesn't mean you're going to make money. And so, a lot of the, the millennials have been kind of nervous about heavily investing in the stock market, like previous generations have. But what ends up happening is, if by just putting the money in the bank or just getting you know one or two percent interest in a money market, you're giving up this tremendous opportunity to compound your money, which can result in a substantial nest egg when you are ready to retire. No, it's a, it's a great point. Um, but as you point out, um, look, the, the, let's face it, when 2008 happened, uh, and there, were, there, there was greed all over the place, it, it started with the credit agencies that were responsible to report, whether it was Fitch or Dun & Bradstreet or whoever, they all gave a, a AAA rating to these uh, mortgage-backed security packages. And then the people who had the mortgages paying them you know, collapsed, and and the, so the whole system collapsed. So even from the point of how they were rated, and then going to uh, Lehman Brothers and to uh, even Bank of America and Chase and all of them, um, they were churning so to get investors to buy pieces of these things, and the whole thing fell apart. So. It seems to me that what happened after that, as I'm told, is that there was a huge drop-off of investors in the market. The market came back beautifully, by the way, but the universe of investors in terms of numbers was much smaller, and therefore most people did not participate in the growth of the market subsequent to the crash. Is that correct? It's correct. And the reason why many people chose not to participate or, or re-participate in the markets other people said, hey, I, you know, I just saw what happened to my parents or whoever. I'm, I'm not going to put myself in that position. It's because there was a lot of greed, as you say. There was a lot of fraud, manipulation, uh, whatever you want to call it. But what it causes, ultimately, is it causes people to be, um, you know, less trusting of what's out there and wanting to be more conservative. It's like, you know, I, you know I'd rather have the money in the bank. Okay, I'm not going to make uh, 8, 10, 15, 20% return but at least I know my money is going to be there when I need it. And that seems like a, quote, unquote, safer mentality, but if you look at a chart of the, the Dow over the last, you know, 100 years, 
yeah, there are times that it's going to go down, but if you look at the overall trend direction of the Dow, all it does is go up. It, you know, it, it's just a kind of a nice angle to, to the upside, but there are going to be those periods of time where it pulls back, but it will recover. But the thing that will empower people is having tools, having education, and when you have tools and education, that, that makes you more confident. And when you're more confident, that's what gives you more confidence and allows you to be more successful ultimately. Well, the, the, you got to have intestinal fortitude as well, because uh, even in the case of you're using analytics, listen, um, I, I'll, I'll use uh, an analogy to my my passion, which is baseball, um, Major League Baseball. Uh, they use analytics left, right, and sideways. I happen to be a Dodger fan, and I and I I have great uh, distress about the fact that Andrew Friedman, the president of the Dodgers, is big on analytics. They just go to the computer and decide how a player's going to do on the field. Well, guess what? Sometimes it doesn't work that way. Uh, Jose Altuve is about five foot six, and he's about the best hitter in baseball uh, on the Houston Astros. Nobody could have predicted that. Nobody could have known that. No analytic would say that. So yeah. what, it, what it comes down to is that, yeah, you can do the analytics in the investment field as they do in baseball with players, and but but even companies are run by human beings, so there's an intangible there as well. If a company's run as a dictatorship, um, you know, by somebody from top down, and they don't give any freedom to the employees and all of that, something that looks great up front could wind up being a catastrophe. Uh, and that's happened with companies, has it not? Absolutely. There are always going to be events that are going to be unpredictable or even random, and um, that's why you know our software, our vantage point. The predictive analytics, we've tested it, we've had it third-party tested, we've had it independently verified, reviewed. I mean, people have picked it apart even during the 2008 time frame to see how did the software hold up during that. You know, it's 86% accurate, and it will never be 100%. And, no, uh, 86 is a very good percentage, by the way. That's just, Look, if you oh. get 86% per predictability with ball players too, that would be great. So, I mean, that's a great number. I'm not criticizing the number. I think it's great. But, um, but but the the point is is in this case there's no such thing as a hundred. You know, if my daughter came home and said I got an eighty six, I said eh, you need to study, you need to try better. If she said no, Dad, it's an eighty six out of ninety. Well, then I'm saying, well, that's a, that's you know almost as good as you can expect. And that's that's the whole point is that when we're talking about the financial markets, and I agree with you, um, there are going to be random events, unpredictable events, which make it impossible to ever reach a hundred percent. No, the I, best I, you can hope for is to stack the odds in your favor and give yourself an edge. What I'm saying, too, is that you might find an individual company that you're familiar with that uh, could be and clearly, to, to you, uh, one that's going to explode because of the way they function and what they're dealing with. Um, and and I, you can see that happen, too. Uh, mm -hmm. But obviously, you can't make all your decisions on personal knowledge of companies as an investor because you don't have the time to do it, as we just discussed. Let me come back and let's pick up on the point of how you deal with, uh, in your situation, uh, the investment of money or advice that you give for investing money and uh, how people can do that and come out ahead. And we'll also get into that survey that was done to find out what millennials are really thinking about a variety of issues. Mike Siegel here, good to have you with us. Lane Mendelson from Vantage Point is with us after this. Back we are. Good to be in. Mike Siegel here. Lane Mendelson is with us. He's president of Vantage Point, which is a pioneer in trading software. Um, does that mean then, Mr. Mendelson, that your company makes available software to uh, your customers and the people buy the software and use that to do their investing? Yeah, we've uh, we've been developing software since uh, the late uh, 1970s. My father actually started the company in 1979. And we came out with um, our first program to help empower individual traders and investors in 1983. And uh, we've just continued over the decades to pioneer by looking for technology that will stack the odds in the favor of the trader and investor and give them the information they need to make the right decisions at the right times. But we also couple that with education. It's not only about having tools and it's not only about having education. They really go hand in hand. You have to have both to ultimately be consistently successful. 
So I, what what does the software do? Does it analyze the uh, the the market and stocks? And, and it does, is it a matter of investing in individual stocks, investing in mutual funds, investing in bonds? What is it that winds up happening as a result of the software? Well, the the majority of our of our customers are trading individual stocks but we also do forecast for the ETFs, the exchange-traded funds, which are like baskets of stocks. Very similar to a mutual fund, but they they, um, you know, they trade more efficiently and more effectively, and a lot of people who previously were involved in mutual funds have migrated to the ETFs. But what the software is doing is it's analyzing the global market relationships. We are in a global economy. Everyone understands that. The problem is that most traders and investors don't have a truly global approach. So, for example, if they're trading a, a stock like Apple, they're just analyzing Apple. They're reading news about Apple, looking at charts of Apple. Everything is really focused on Apple. But the truth of the matter is, is that Apple is a global company, and there are so many other factors globally, both domestically and internationally, that can drive and impact the price of Apple stock. And so that means, you got yes, of course you have to be focused on Apple, but you got to look at the tech sector as a whole and other tech stocks. And then you also have to look at the, the just major U.S. stock indices, the Dow, the NASDAQ, the S&P. you got to look at commodity prices and currency prices and interest rate prices because all of these other factors and, and their movement will ultimately impact the price of Apple. And so there are hidden patterns in data, and there are relationships in these markets that move and drive each other and so what we've done is we've created a patented technology over the last 30 years that analyzes massive quantities of data using artificial intelligence and deep machine learning to detect these hidden patterns and doing very in-depth pattern recognition to more accurately forecast where's Apple going to go based on all these other factors and how they impact the price of Apple. Yeah, but that's where we've been able to achieve this 86% accuracy. All right, but but you're talking about one stock. I mean, we're talking about the market here. So, um, in, in other words, before I get into the areas that you describe that the software deals with, if somebody at home were to look at this, would would your software say to the person, uh, you ought to buy 50 shares of this stock, or you ought to buy uh, ten thousand dollars from you based on how much you have in your investment portfolio, ten thousand dollars in shares of this particular field, whether it's high tech, uh, air transit, um, the airline industry, or um, retail. Um, in other words, how does well, what does this software do after you use it? What does it tell the person using it? So it, it can give the overall sentiment for a particular sector, but then it can drill down into a specific stock in a sector, like Apple or, you know, Facebook, Tesla, whatever the stock happens to be. But what it's going to do is it's going to tell the individual, okay, tomorrow this stock is expected to start going up, and there are several different indicators that you want to all see in alignment and in agreement. And when you get four or five different predictive artificial intelligence-based indicators all pointing in the same direction telling you that a particular stock is going to begin trending up tomorrow, well, then you know that tomorrow is, is the most optimal time to get into that stock and, and buy however many shares that individual person is comfortable with, and that's going to vary based on that person's age and income and, you know, other personal factors. But the point is is that by getting that advance notice that that stock is about to start going up, you get to get in early before the masses do. After three, four, five days of that stock price increasing and going up, then it starts to get recognized on the news, and it becomes a trending stock ticker. Then the masses jump in, and what does that do? Poof, that drives the price up even more. The people who make the most money are the ones that have the advanced knowledge and notice to get in before the masses. And that's what we're doing is by looking at all these other related markets and factors that impact the particular stock, we're able to get these early clues as to where and when is the best time to get into a stock, and that's right, so, giving our customers such an edge. So uh, the, 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 let me ask a, a question, just a hypothetical. Uh, would, would your system have said sell Facebook before that day when it lost $119 billion in value? 
I mean, would it have picked? No. Would some? It's, so there are going to be anomalies that. Well, you said eighty-six percent. So you're going to have anomalies. In fact, theoretically, and I don't know if this happened. I mean, your your system could have said buy Facebook at that point because it was something that was, I think, for the most part, pretty much unanticipated, right? I'll give you two examples as it relates to Facebook and Tesla. So with Facebook, the reason why Facebook dropped so pre precipitously that day is because they had an earnings call, and they said, look, we're growing. We're just not growing as much as we previously were. We're not adding as many users. And so investors said, eh, they're not growing like they were, and that caused the stock to plummet. Couldn't have predicted that to happen, of course, because that wasn't something that was predictable. That was more fundamentally driven. So we weren't able to forecast that. However, if you're investing in the markets, you got to use some common sense and watch the news and keep abreast of the fact that, hey, Facebook's going to be making this announcement. I need to keep an eye on my position in Facebook if I'm in and protect my position with stops so that if this market does reverse quickly like it did, you can exit that position with a profit versus watching it all disappear literally in minutes. As it relates to Tesla, Tesla, as you know, um, jumped up, the stock jumped up uh, quite a bit last week because Elon Musk put this tweet out there that he's considering taking the company private. Well, you know, um, that couldn't have been predicted. No one knew that he was going to do that except for probably him. But in this case, Vantage Point had actually predicted Tesla to start going up about a week before that happened. So our customers had that advance notice that Tesla stock was going to start going up. This is when it was about just under $300 a share. They were able to get into that position many days prior to this tweet. And so when that tweet came out, which obviously was not predictable, it drove the stock price up very quickly. But customers were already able to have been into that position, so they benefited tremendously from that unpredictable event. Now, we, we talked about the fact that uh, the millennials are putting in a lot of hours. I, I, I suppose that's regardless of what field they're in. I mean, nowadays people are working a lot of hours, being very productive, a lot of jobs out there. Uh, we're, and this is, sounds like a, a, somebody listening to this might get their eyes glazed over a little bit and say, well, how can I do that? And that's why I hire an investment counselor. My question is, uh, who's going to have the time to put in to do all of this rather than using an outside investment counselor and instead themselves using your software? Well, first of all, you know, um, I think a lot of people have been unimpressed by the, the quote-unquote professionals, the people who manage money for people professionally. And, and we saw that in, you know, the 2008-2009 time frame. Um, so, first of all, I don't think that that's necessarily the best way to go turn your money over to a stranger. I think the best approach is become educated, get the right tools. To your point, at what cost? How much time will that take? And what we've done is we've designed our, our software so that it literally takes 10 minutes in the evening and people can very quickly glean the information they need, make their decisions, and go about their life and not have this consume their life. We'll come right back and pick it up. I want to get to also uh, the survey and then the uh, other people, the uh, ages 37 and above, uh, before you get to 65. What do you do in, in that age group? We'll come right back with lots more. Mike Siegel in. Stay with us. We're back with you. Good to be here. Mike Siegel in as we get back to our conversation with our guest. I appreciate you taking the time. Lane Mendelson, Vantage Point, is his company. He's president. His father founded it. And they supply software and education for people who want to do investing on their own. Uh, let me turn to the study uh, by Bank Rate, the Federal Reserve, and the Bank of the West. Uh, they found that 23% of millennials, again now age 17 to 37, prefer investing as opposed to cash. Does that mean that 23% would be the type that we interested in the kinds of software and instruction that you offer, for example? Yeah, absolutely. These are people who want to have control over their own financial future. They want to be self-directed. They don't want some stranger to shepherd their money for them because they've seen that that hasn't worked out the best. At the same time, they know that they need tools, they need education, and we have been seeing um, a growing number of younger people, and I say, yeah, I mean, I'm 38, so I'm just over that, that mark of being a millennial, but we've seen more people in my age bracket um, in, in the recent years 
coming to us saying, look, I don't want to wake up and be 65 and say, uh, I need to figure out how I'm going to, you know, live out my golden years. I want to start early. And so we've seen a lot of people come to us saying, show me the way, get me on the right path. I want to start now versus, you know, 30 years from now. And then uh, that means 77% probably are satisfied with cash or not even thinking about retirement. So that, as a matter of public policy and society, that's a problem, isn't it? This, the, those yeah. people will become burdens on society down the road. Yeah, and I don't know if it's that they're not thinking about it. I think they might just not be educated or know where to turn. You know, I think a lot of people uh, probably say, gosh, you know, I want to be, you know, financially free. I want to be able to retire at a, at a decent age. I want to have the money I need to live the lifestyle, but, but how do I do that? And if you didn't have someone to point you in the right direction, you know, you, um, you might not sure where, be sure where to turn. And so I'm, I'm hoping that through our efforts of providing the, the tools and the education, we can help more people who genuinely would like to put themselves in a good position but just don't know how to, to get on that right path. And uh, we've been doing more and more on the education side coupled with the tools to help those people who, who really want to take advantage of the opportunities and just need some, some guidance. Well, of course, and they have to think about that consciously. But I'm going to tell you, as you no doubt know, a lot of people just immersed in their careers, their families, and just getting by day to day, paying the insurance on the car, the mortgage on the home, the clothing for the kids to go to school, college tuition, uh, not at 37, but certainly thinking about that. So, you know, there's a lot going on that they don't get into thinking about this. And I'm saying that down the road, as we have right now, uh, there could be a real problem in terms of those who get to retirement and have a difficulty supporting themselves. A matter of fact, uh, you, the study points out 41% of millennials, again, I'm going to say it's 17 to 37 years of age right now, don't even have a retirement account. So doesn't that tell you that uh, they're not proactively focused on their future? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's the sad fact is that they, they are not putting themselves in a position to be successful later in life and to avoid becoming a burden on society. And I'm hoping that more and more people um, will start to take proactive measures and ask the right questions, seek out the guidance, because the information is there. You know, we could take somebody who literally has no trading experience and in a very short period of time, we can teach them the basics, we can give them the tools, we can be there to coach them and guide them and help them to become successful. doesn't mean that they're going to, you know, quit their job overnight and, you know, now they're uh, a multimillionaire, but it means that each month they can grow their account steadily, they can take a certain portion if they can, you know, allocate and, and continue to add to that account and build themselves up over time. And if you're starting when you're young, I mean, you start in your 30s. By the time you're 50, you've got a tremendous advantage over people who currently are in their 50s and 60s saying, gosh, you know, I don't have what I need. And, you know, I, I lost a lot of money in the 2008, 2009 financial crisis, didn't get back in right away because I was scared. So, you know, it's just a matter of, of having people start to think about the future in the present versus waiting until, you know, the the future has come, and then they say, gosh, you know, I, I didn't prepare myself. So Well, I, I think there's a lot of people who uh, who do not prepare themselves and, and don't want to think about it. Thirty percent of millennials choose cash over other methods of investment, so that, uh, that, that would just mean that they put cash in the bank, and it certainly is not going to grow the way it would if you put it into some kind of other investment portfolio. Uh, I think we both agree on that. And then one out of three millennials, as you said earlier, use retirement savings to fund their first home. What I, well, I look at it from a, you look at it from your business, I look at it from a societal point of view, and it seems to me that we're getting worse instead of better in terms of people getting to retirement and having to depend more and more on government. Um, it strikes me that uh, another area entirely is Social Security, and instead of just having Social Security for people when they go to work at, let's say, the age of 22 uh, or 25, why not say that they could choose Social Security or they could choose some kind of an investment portfolio that the government would, that the, that the company would invest for them? Why not do that? I think that'd be a, a good uh, option. I think millennials, because of the distrust that they have, might say, ah, I don't know if I trust the company investing on my behalf. So then it falls back to, okay, well, do, does, does the individual, does the millennial have the knowledge, the expertise, the tools, to manage the money successfully. In most of the cases, 
I would say not, and that's where, you know, we're really focusing on helping to prepare people so that they can say, yes, I am prepared, I am qualified, I am competent, I am confident, and I can be successful on my own. Well, but if you, as you know, if you put, you said it yourself about the stock market, if you put the money into the um, market in the, in the proper fashion, um, you're going you're gonna to see geometrically more return at retirement and then you're going to see from the way Social Security is now. Um, there's not much of a, a growth of, so, of the dollars you put into Social Security. There's a huger growth. Um, just putting in, you know, you said it earlier about Buffett's point about um, a compounding of interest being the eighth wonder of the world. The fact is that um, if you put in, even starting at 22 to 67, 200 bucks a month, isn't that going to turn into a pretty substantial amount of money? Absolutely. So that's my point. Let's turn to the, and, and people should think about that is my point, and, the, and maybe Congress ought to think about it. They've talked about it, is giving people options with their Social Security money going to an investment portfolio still required to take the money out of your paycheck uh, for public policy to have it put into an account, but maybe give people an option with some safe investments outside of Social Security. Now let me turn to um, people over the age of 37. Uh, at 65, it's pretty much a done deal. Some people are still working um, and doing very well. But what do we do about people who are, uh, say, 37 to 60? Um, you know, the, in that age group, um, is it too late for them to get started with investing? No, no, absolutely not. And uh, but here's the thing: it's absolutely not with a caveat. When you're 37, 38 to, to 60. Your time horizon, obviously, is, is more limited than if you were in your 20s. That's not a bad thing necessarily unless you aren't on the right path and you waste time and money making the wrong decisions and going down these dead-end trails. So it's very important as your age increases that you're very cautious about what you're doing. You don't have the, the time or luxury to make this, ah, I made a mistake, blew up my uh, retirement account, let me start over. And so we have people who contact say, look, I'm 60 years old. I don't have what I need. I need to be on the right track. And we tell them a couple of things. First of all, we say, we need to get you the right tools. You need to be able to um, monitor the markets, make the right decisions at the right times. We're going to give you the coaching and the education that you need. And they need to paper trade. They need to just kind of build up their own confidence and do some uh, kind of like with monopoly money, but saying, okay, I'm going to buy this stock here. I'm going to sell it here. I made money. Great. Building up a confidence we kind of making the mistakes on paper so that then when they start trading with real money, they've already made the mistakes, they've ironed out the wrinkles, they've tied up the loose ends. Now it's go time. And now they're not playing around, they're not gambling, they're not making silly mistakes. They can really start building up that, that retirement account. So it's important to take the time to practice, start off small, be conservative, and not only look at making money but protecting your money. There's a lot of people who have a reasonable size nest egg, and in their attempt to grow it, they end up losing it. So it's got to be, number one, capital preservation, and then number two, how do I take the money that I've worked hard for and put it to work for me? Well, that's a, that's, that's a crucial point, and it's got to be very disciplined. Um, and, and it goes back to what somebody's lifestyle. Look, if somebody's working uh, 14 hours a day uh, and they – um, have just enough time to get some rest and be with their family. Maybe they don't want to get take on something like this that involves, um, you know, a lot of some amount of time to do your portfolio. On the other hand, there are people who can do it, uh, and and it would be worth doing. But the bottom, the, the real point here is that people need to, the the message here is people need to think about their future and about putting away funds to protect them in the time of an emergency or in the time of retirement. As we wrap up, what's your message in 25 seconds? I would say that you've got to get the right tools, you've got to get the education, and you, as you say, you need to start thinking about the future now so that you can position yourself and your family to prosper in the coming years because there's going to be a lot of tremendous opportunities for those who are in the know. Good to talk to you, Mr. Mendelson. Vantage Point is the company. We appreciate your time, and thank you for the insight. Good to have you with us.